And we pray this in his strong name. Amen. Well, our Bible reading this evening comes from Ruth chapter 2. John will be bringing God's word to us in a moment's time. Um, But we'll start our reading from Ruth chapter 2. But for those who weren't able to be out last Sunday evening, just rejog your memories where we are. Uh, Naomi and her family had left Bethlehem, left Israel to go to Moab, left the place Bethlehem, the place of bread, the place of sustenance and life. And they found themselves in Moab to be a place of death. She loses her husband. She loses her sons, and she comes back to Bethlehem with only her daughter-in-law clung to her, saying, I will go with you. Your God people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So we pick up the scene now after Naomi has lost nearly everything, but at a moment of hope because we hear that in Bethlehem, the place of bread, the place of life, The harvest is just about to arrive. So let's pick up from chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him, in whose sight I shall find favour. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And he answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young men, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now, Listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me? since I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, that I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, 
the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. <laughs> Well, good evening. Let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Well, as we turn to the second chapter of this little book of Ruth, let me remind you in a bit more detail about what we are looking at last week in the first chapter god's chosen people had begun to settle down in the land of canaan the excitement of entering the promised land and taking cities like jericho soon waned and slowly they became attached to canaan's people to canaan's morals and to canaan's gods furthermore they began to disobey the Lord God and his laws. And for some 300 years, up until about 1050 BC, there was this repeated cycle of disobedience, oppression, cries of distress to God, miraculous deliverances by God. He raised up judges and then back to disobedience. And oppression again. And it's all summed up in the words with which the book of Judges ends everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It was a time of religious degeneracy, moral disunity, national disunity, and foreign oppression. And it was in the midst of that mess, sometime in that 300 year period, that we have this moving story beautifully told in the book of Ruth. It's the story of ordinary country folk and their faith in God. And the very inclusion of this story in the Bible should be a great encouragement to us. Because we live in days when the vast majority of people in our country have little time for God. And they're far from far more interested in themselves. And an onlooker looking in would say, everyone does what is right in his own eyes. But the book of Ruth tells us that even, even in such circumstances, there are a few, maybe only a very few, who are not so taken up with themselves do still trust in God and are seeking to live for him. In chapter 1, we are introduced to the two of the main characters of the book. There's Naomi from Bethlehem in Judah, but had gone with her husband and her two sons during the time of famine to live in Moab. No idea why they went to Moab of all places. At least there was food there. Within 10 short years, Naomi's husband had died, her two sons married Moabite women, and then tragically they both died. If anyone had reason to become bitter, it was Naomi. But she didn't. I know she tells the folk back in Bethlehem on her return to call her Mara, which means bitter, but no one did. She herself wasn't bitter. Indeed, we saw last week, 
her faith in God was strengthened and blossomed. We saw that in the way she spoke about the Lord, the covenant God of his people, seeing his hand in what would happen. The way she spoke about the Almighty, the God who can transform hopeless situations. And the way she prayed that her daughters-in-law would experience God's covenant faithfulness and peace. It seems clear that the very trials and difficulties, far from marring her, made her. Her faith was tested, but it came forth all the stronger. Second character is Ruth, after whom the book is named, one of Naomi's daughters-in-law. She was a Moabitess, who after a few short years of marriage was left a widow with no children. The natural thing, especially when her mother-in-law decided to return to Judah, would have been for her to return home, find another husband, and settle down in Moab. But no, Ruth wanted to stay with Naomi. As we concluded last week, because of the other things that Ruth said, that she'd been attracted by Naomi's faith to Naomi's God, this Lord, the Almighty, and despite Naomi's efforts to persuade her to go back, Ruth was determined to stay, and she committed herself not only to Naomi, but to Naomi's God. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Ruth from pagan Moab. Well, she may well have heard of Israel's God in the past, what he'd done, but having lived with Naomi, for a few years, having seen Naomi cope with tragedy, having heard what Naomi's God had done for his people, she wasn't only attracted to him, but she wanted to follow him. She wanted to belong to him, and she committed herself to him. Just an aside, before we go further, you never know what your quiet testimony quiet testimony of your faith, how you cope with tragedy, how you speak about Jesus. You never know what effect that may have on others. It may be the means of attracting them to Jesus. The third main character in our story is introduced for us in the very first verse of the second chapter. If we've got there, okay. Look at chapter 2 with me. In contrast to the other two characters, Naomi and Ruth, this third character was quite different. He was clearly well off, a man of standing, as one translation has it. His name was Boaz. The writer tells us that he was a relative of Naomi's husband. Now, you need to remember that we are being let into the secret here. Ruth and Naomi didn't realize who he was until after the events of this chapter are outlined here. So, we're given the secret right away. Okay. The important thing at this stage is that Boaz is also a man of faith in the Lord. Well, you might be saying, well, wasn't he one of the chosen people of Israel living in the Promised Land? Didn't they all have faith in the Lord? Well, they all believed in the Lord, in the one God. But they didn't all have a living personal trust in him. And that's what I'm talking about. See, it's one thing to believe in God. It's another to trust in him. According to Jesus, even, even the devils believe in God. Of course they do. But they don't trust him. Boaz trusted in the Lord. In days when everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, he was a man who was different. How can I say that? Well, look, just look at the way in verse 4, the way he greets his workers. Verse 4, the Lord be with you. And they replied, the Lord bless you. Now, do you notice it's, it's, it's the Lord in capital letters again? We noted that last week. We said it was so important. 
It's the covenant name of God. The name that reminds the people that God had bound himself to them. The name of the God who makes promises and keeps them. The Lord, capital letter. No, this is the only time that this particular greeting is found in this form. And that would seem to indicate that there was, was more than a mere greeting. He, was, he wasn't simply saying, hello, how are you today? Even the ordinariness of daily work is seen by Boaz in the context of faith in the covenant God whose land it is. And then later in verse 12, notice, Boaz says to Ruth, having explained that he knows about what she'd done, he says, the Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And again, he's using the God's covenant name. He's speaking about God as if he knew him. And he implies that he and his people are already taking refuge under God's wing. And that Ruth the foreigner joined them. I think it's an expression of his own faith in the Lord. So here's a man of faith, unashamedly speaking about the Lord to his workmen and to a foreign slave girl. I wonder if it's notable today for people in the things that, that we say and do, that we are Christian. They ought to be, didn't they? Chapter 2 is the about what happened when Naomi and Ruth first arrived back in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Ruth, you see, verse 2, Ruth suggests that she goes into the field and picks up the leftover grain behind the harvesters. Now, she must have been told, presumably by Naomi, about the provision in the law of Moses for gleaning, as it's called. See, out of a concern for the helpless, the poor, and the sojourner, the law... And you can read about it in, in Leviticus chapter 19. The law required reapers in a field at harvest time, as well as husbandmen in the vineyards and olive groves, to leave behind a portion of the crop, including the edges of the grain fields, to be collected by the needy. In addition, the reapers were not to go back for the grain that they'd missed or dropped. It was left for the needy. Well, Naomi agreed, and Ruth set off and found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. At this stage, of course, she didn't know whose field it was. She didn't know who Boaz was. She worked away, and to her surprise, I guess, the boss told her to stay with his servant girls. And when she was thirsty, to go get a drink of water from the water jars. Then she was invited to share lunch with them. And when she returned to her gleaning, she seemed to get on extremely well. And by evening, she threshed the barley that she gathered. It amounted to really as much as one person could carry. And when Naomi saw what she'd gathered, and when she heard the name of the man in whose field she worked, Boaz, she exclaimed, the Lord has not sh stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. See, Naomi saw it as an indication of the Lord's kindness. No. I mentioned that word last week as well. It's a great word in the Old Testament. At the very heart of God's covenant relationship with his people. Kindness. Sometimes called grace. It's a word for steadfast love and covenant faithfulness all rolled together. Combining the warmth of God's fellowship with the security of God's faithfulness. And Naomi then encourages Ruth to continue working in Boaz's field until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. That's the story. But what does this story have to teach us today? What are we meant to learn from this chapter? Well, I want to focus our thoughts on that lovely picture which Boaz gives us in verse 12, where he speaks of Ruth coming to take refuge under the wings of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, I don't know where Boaz got that picture of the Lord having wings. I don't know where he got it from. I like to think that he got it from the Bible. 
his life. Because this isn't the first time that the Lord is likened to a bird. At the end of his long life, Moses was looking back at all that the Lord had done for his people in bringing them out of Egyptian bondage through the wilderness to the borders of the promised land. And Moses recited the words of, of the song that's recorded for us in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And in that song, Moses describes how God found them in the desert, shielded and cared for them, guarded them as the apple of his eye. And then he says in verse 11, listen to this, you can look it up if you like, but this is what it says. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. Well, Boaz uses the same picture the Lord, the covenant God, as a mighty eagle under whose strong wings Ruth had come to take refuge. David uses the same picture, taking refuge under the Lord's wings, in at least five of his Psalms. 17, 36, 57, 61, and 63. It's a lovely picture of what had happened to Ruth. See, what does that day old chick do at the first sign of danger? He scurries to get under his mother's wings. He comes to take refuge. It's almost instinctive. It's the place he should be. It's the place of safety. We used to keep hens, chickens, in Helmsdale. We also kept them in Ireland and Latterly in Stirling. I don't have any at the moment. Once in Helmsdale, when, when I was going to embarrass her, when Sarah was about the same age as Emily, we had a broody hen and we hatched a few chicks. And it was lovely to see the old hen, first sign of danger, gathering the young chicks under her wings, the place of safety and protection. And that's what Ruth had done, isn't it? She'd been attracted to the Lord through Naomi, but more than that, she'd committed herself to Naomi's God, leaving everything to follow him. She trusted him in just the same way that that young eagle chick trusts its mother. Ruth didn't know what was going to happen. She simply trusted herself to the Lord. And, and that, you know, that's what it means to trust in God as opposed to believing God. I guess there are very few people who don't believe in God, believe that there is a God, that is. You just need to look around, see the, the sky at night, all the stars. You just need to see the, the intricate detail of your own body. You can't help we but believe there is a God, but to trust in God is something else. It means coming to him, relying on him, leaning on him, committing yourself to him running to him for safety, hiding under his wing. And it's not a matter of being born into the right family, knowing all about God. Ruth was a foreigner from Moab. She probably knew little about the Lord God. It's not a matter of about being particularly good. There's no evidence that Ruth was better than anybody else. It's not a matter of doing all the right religious things or going to the temple or offering sacrifices. And the temple wasn't even built then, but there's no evidence that Ruth offered sacrifices. It's not a matter of living a good life. And so to win God's approval, certainly Ruth was hard working and polite, we see that. See how she asked for, for permission to work in that field. But it's clear these things didn't make her a woman of faith. All that Ruth had done was to was to come to Naomi's God to hide under his wing. Just as a chick comes to the mother bird. And that's, that's what's involved in being a Christian today. You know, it's quite simple. It's not a matter of being born into a correct family, even a church family. It's not a matter of being particularly good. It's not a matter of doing all the right religious things. Coming to church, reading your Bible. It needs help, of course. 
It's not a matter of living a good life, but of good works. That's important. It's all about coming to the Lord, recognizing that we are totally dependent on him, recognizing that before him we are nothing, and casting ourselves on his mercy, hiding under his wing. Well, perhaps, I don't know, perhaps there's someone here tonight or someone listening in online, and you're trying so hard to be a Christian, trying to be good, trying to do lots of good things. Well, you, well you're only wearing yourself out, aren't you? Stop trying and start trusting. Come to the Lord like a helpless chick and hide under the shelter of his wing. But this picture of taking refuge under the Lord's wings is also a picture of some of the blessings of trusting in the Lord. And I want to notice four blessings that apply to Ruth then and apply to us today as believers. The first blessing is what I'm calling godly providences. Look at verse 3. Having received permission from Naomi to go gleaning, verse 3 says, So Ruth set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came. It just so happened that she went and worked in Boaz's field, and it just so happened that Boaz arrived just then. Quite unbeknown to Ruth, the Lord had it all worked out. That's one advantage of being an older believer, like me. You can look back and see the way the Lord has directed your path sometimes by things that just so happen. We may not see it at the time. We just sang William Cowper's hymn, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform, he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Well, you see, the problem of looking for footprints planted in the sea as they're immediately invisible, aren't they? Sometimes we can't see what God's doing. At other times, it's not long before the seeming coincidences become clear. It was in 1979. I was all set to purchase my own vet practice in the Lake District. How it did it. But over the several weeks before that, just things just were not working out at all. And then on the Saturday morning, the day after I finished my employment with the university foreign practice, that Saturday morning, I had a phone call indicating that someone else was threatening to start a practice in the same town. And as I was speaking to this guy, I knew I knew that we weren't going to the Lake District. But what were we to do? The next day, Sunday, at the morning service, our assistant minister just happened to preach on one verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about a bugle making a, a distinct sound preparing people for battle. And I thought, what on earth is he talk, going to talk about from one verse? And he spoke about the need for preachers who would preach clearly. But all I could think about that day was, what a strange text. In the evening service, our minister just happened to be preaching through the book of Jonah. He came that night to chapter 3, which begins, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to Nineveh and preach. And he too just happened to go on and on about the need for preaching. 
I might have been the only person in church that day. God called me to be a preacher. And I guess many of you older believers can look back and recount times when, when things have just happened at the right time and your path has been redirected. That's one blessing of living under the wings of the Lord. We experience these godly providences. The Lord wonderfully directs our path. The second blessing for Ruth, as she took refuge under the Lord's wing, is what I'm calling generous provision for her needs. Generous provision. In those early days of the chick's life, what happened? The eagle, adult bird, take it in turns to, to, to hunt to prey, bring it back to the nest, tear it to pieces, and drop it into the chick's open mouth. Have you seen it on, on the screen? And the chicks grow so rapidly in those early days. There's more than an adequate supply of food in a form that they can take in. There's generous provision for their needs. And in the story of Ruth, just look how Boaz provided for Ruth. Not only drink when she was thirsty, but food at mealtime. Verse 14, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. Remember, she's a foreigner without the standing of one of, her, one of his servant girls. And this is her first day. Then Boaz himself offers her some roasted grain, a kind of special treat. It's a sign of special favor. And she wasn't just given a taste. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. And then when she returns to her gleaning, Boaz had given orders to his men to allow her to glean among the sheaves, not just behind them. He actually told his men to pull out handfuls of stalks and leave them for her. He's being extremely generous, making sure she has plenty. By evening, she had an ifa. Now, what's that? It's 13 kilograms, 28 pounds, 14 bags of sugar. That's some weight, isn't it? Can you imagine her staggering home along the road with this great sack of barley weighing her down. It was an unusually large amount for one day. And if it kept on to the end of harvest, well, Ruth and Naomi would have plenty, enough to last them the rest of the year. What a generous provision for their immediate needs and their long-term needs. But what a picture that is of God's generous provision for those who come to take refuge under his wings. Like Ruth, we are poor spiritually, I mean. We have no claim on God's kindness. Why should he be bothered with us? But despite knowing all about us, the Lord so generously provides for all our needs. He gives us his word. He gives us his promises. Just what we need at the right time. He gives us comfort and strength and guidance and direction and assurance and hope. As we take refuge under his wings, as we trust in him, the Lord generously supplies our needs. Third blessing of being under the wings of refuge is this. There's gracious protection from harm. Here the tiny chicks are safe because any predator would have to deal with a parent bird first. It's a place of safety. In verse 9 of our story, we read of how Boaz told his men not to touch Ruth. He knew they might take advantage of a young widow and a foreigner. In verses 15 and 16, he tells his men not to embarrass her or rebuke her. In verse 22, Naomi recognizes that it was good for Ruth to go with Boaz, men, because in another field she might be assaulted. You see, these were dangerous days for widows. They could be taken advantage of. And men could be quite hard on women who came around gleaning and getting in the way of their work. Boaz graciously protected Ruth from harm. He knew she was vulnerable. 
Being the boss, he took steps to protect them. The Lord graciously protects those who come to him for refuge. He's no need to. In fact, in the way we treat him at times, ignoring him, grumbling about him, blaming him when things go wrong, he's every reason to leave us alone. But no, no, he protects us. More sorts of harm and danger. He knows how vulnerable we are. He knows that there's a devil prowling around like a lion to frighten us with his loud roars, sliding around like a snake, serpent to memorize us with attractive suggestions. He knows how easily we fall and in his kindness he protects us from harm. In him we are safe. The devil's defeated. Chained up. Can't touch him. And there's a fourth blessing under God's wings. There are glorious prospects for the future. Glorious prospects. That picture of the eagle that Moses used was all about that. He spoke of the eagle stirring up its nest and hovering over its young, spreading its wings to catch them and carry them on its pinions. What's he doing? The angel is teaching the young to fly. There they are, high up on some rocky crag, and the parent bird pushes, pushes them out the nest. The youngster makes a first faltering attempt, flap, flaps its wings, but begins to fall freely. And the parent bird stoops down, catches him on her wings, and carries him back to safety. The next day it happens again and again. Before long, the young bird can fly all by itself. Wow, think of it. Able to soar to the heights. Free. What a glorious prospect. And part of Naomi's happiness and thrill that day was that this provision and protection augured well for the future. Ruth was going to be safe if this carried on to the end of the harvest. Well, they'd have more than enough for the winter. This prospect was bright, but the main thing, the main thing, is what she goes on to say in verse 20. This man is a close relative of ours, one of our kinsmen redeemers. So think more about that next week. But that day, it meant for Naomi that God hadn't abandoned her. It hadn't been a coincidence. This man was one of the men who had responsibility for her and her future. The prospects were bright. And for those who trust in the laws who take refuge under his wings, the prospects are glorious. Not only do we experience godly providences as the Lord works in all things for our good, not only do we have generous provision for our real needs, not only do we have gracious protection from all harm, we have in Jesus a kinsman who has fulfilled all the obligations of a redeemer. He's dealt with our sin. He's paid the price to redeem us. And we have heaven to look forward to. Just as the eagle chick has been made to fly to the heights, we have been made for heaven. Trusting in God. We're going there. What more glorious prospects could we wish for? Oh, it's a wonderful thing to be a follower of Jesus, isn't it? Wonderful. To be under his wings, the wings of refuge. So, believer, take heart tonight. Take heart. Whatever you're going through just now, and some of you are going through pretty difficult times. Well, take heart. Remember, now you are under the wings of refuge. You're safe. The Lord is at work in your life, sometimes in mysterious ways. You might 
You might not see, you might never see it, but he's at work. The Lord does provide far more than we deserve. The Lord does protect. You're safe. And one day, one day, he'll take us to be with him forever in glory. What a salvation. What a God. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, how wonderful that we can take refuge under your wings and experience all these amazing blessings. Lord, help us, like Ruth, to unquestionably accept your providence and keep on trusting you. Help us, like Naomi, to recognize your kindness, your steadfast love and covenant faithfulness in all the events of our life. And help us, like Boaz, to unashamedly speak about our Lord in our daily work. We pray in Jesus' name. For our closing song.